So what I want to talk about today is some work that I've been doing with uh, Sasha Hako, a graduate student of mine in Cambridge, uh, Andy Strominger here at Harvard, and Stephen Hawking when he was still alive back in Cambridge. What we've been interested in is the black hole information paradox and how one might go around uh, resolving it. So I guess I should point, tell you that we have not solved the information paradox and everything that we have <laughs> been doing uh, suggests that although we've made some significant steps towards understanding what's going on, uh, it's been breeding more problems than we have been able to uh, address. So the first step is to try and understand why it is that we think black holes have an entropy. Because we believe that the microstates of a black hole are somehow where the information is going to reside. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, Aaron pointed out to us that one of the first signs that there was some kind of uh, similarity between the laws of thermodynamics and the laws of black hole mechanics uh, was that there was an area increase formula which somehow looked a little bit like the second law of thermodynamics. Also, before uh, Hawking discovered that black holes had a temperature, there was a first law of black hole mechanics which basically looked rather like the first law of thermodynamics. It simply said that a change in the mass of the black hole was equal to something that looked like a geometrical quantity, kappa dA over 8 pi, where kappa is the surface gravity, together with some mechanical things that looked like phi dQ. Uh, phi is the electrostatic potential of the black hole, and Q is its charge. So this is the work done if you want to change the charge of the black hole by an infinitesimal amount. Similarly, there's an omega dJ that changes the rotational energy of the black hole by an amount given by the angular velocity times the change in angular momentum. So these are sort of circumstantial evidence that there should be some kind of entropy. That was made concrete in two different ways. The first is that Hawking discovered that the temperature of a black hole was equal to kappa divided by 2 pi. And if you believe that that's the temperature, that immediately tells you that the entropy is equal to A over 4. There's a second way in which you can do this kind of calculation. You can use Euclidean quantum gravity. And Gibbons and Hawking showed how, using the Euclidean methods, you could derive the black hole entropy from uh, a version of the path integral. Lastly, we all sort of have the idea that the entropy should be given by the logarithm of the density of states function for the black holes, given that you're working at fixed m, j, and q, the only three macroscopically measurable quantities outside the black hole. So that's really sort of following on from Boltzmann. So what we want to do is to see if there's some way in which we can describe the entropy from soft hair on black holes. So this is a sort of tortuous path to find out how this is going to work. We're going to start from the gravitational action, which is something like just the integral of the Ricci scalar over the entirety of space-time. And what we're going to do is to use the covariant phase space formulation of general relativity to see if we can understand where the entropy is coming from and how it arises. We're going to do this by following through this uh, sort of program, which was initiated by, well, initially Rudolf Piles, but then uh, subsequently followed up by Ashtakar, and then Wald, Ayer, Lee, Zupas, uh, Witten, Krinkovich, uh, and I guess many others subsequently. So the idea is you start from the metric, you vary the metric so that you perform a small perturbation, HAB, and then you look at how the action varies. And of course, we all know that you get the Einstein tensor times HAB together with a boundary term. The boundary term here we'll describe as a three form in space time. It's usually called the presymplectic potential. And the way in which you should think about this is that if you vary this thing, in a general field theory, what you'll get is, as the boundary term, something like the sum over all canonical momenta and coordinates, something like P 
delta Q. So you want to think of this term here, the pre-symplectic potential, as being like PDQ. If it's really like PDQ, then this object here, where you perform a second variation, is really like the sum over all of the generalized coordinates, dp wedge dq. So this object is a sort of fundamental place in which you start trying to construct a symplectic form for general relativity. So this object is usually called the symplectic current. It's a three form in space time. And if you integrate this current over a space-like surface in space time, then you will define the symplectic form for general relativity. This object is just going to be th this integral over space. Precisely what you mean by space here is a little bit up for grabs, and we'll see why in a moment. Omega is a two-form in the phase space of the theory, and so this encodes how the theory actually behaves. So everything you need to know about the dynamics of the theory is, is encoded in the symplectic form. So the phase space of the theory is really classical solutions of Einstein's equations. And if you want to know about how you, you vary things a little bit, you need to know d the p's and the q's of the theory. They're just given by the tangent vectors in the phase space. And those you can think of as being the perturbations of the metric that solve the linearized Einstein equations. To go with this formulation, there are a collection of charges. And you can define the charge in this way. It's simply the integral over a space-like surface of the symplectic current. But if you make one of your h's just a gauge transformation, that is to say the lead derivative of the metric with respect to some vector field zeta, then this will turn into an integral over a space-like surface, sorry, a a surface embedded in the space-like surface sigma, which you can think of as being some kind of closed surface. So that comes about because if zeta is a gauge transformation, if this is a gauge transformation, then omega is an exact form, and so you can reduce it to this kind of Gaussian type of surface integral. So for any vector field zeta, this thing will define a charge, which you can integrate over a two-surface. The physical interpretation of this is just that Q is the change in some charge conjugate to the vector field zeta if you move from the spacetime G to the spacetime G plus H. So for any vector field zeta, there will be such a charge, and this gives rise to the infinity of charges which can be associated with soft hair if you pick the right zetas. So you can think of some simple examples. You could, for example, think about S being a surface at infinity, uh, zeta being time translation, in which case this will give you the ADM energy. Or you could be a bit more ambitious and say, suppose that S was a two surface, uh, just simply on some space-like surface, in which case, if zeta were some general time translation, it would give you one of the possible definitions of uh, quasi-local energy. But in fact, you can define these things for any surfaces. And we're going to be interested in defining these charges on the event horizon, or to be more precise, on any section of the event horizon. These zetas are just general diffeomorphisms. And the diffeomorphisms form a closed algebra. And so you know that the lead derivative of the lead derivative is going to close and give you the lead derivative of the commutator of two vector fields. That's a general result that you would expect just from the idea of coordinate invariance. That should be reflected in the algebra of charges. So that if you took the bracket, uh, meaning the Dirac bracket of two charges, one associated with zeta and one associated with zeta prime, then as long as diffeomorphism invariance is a symmetry of nature, you would expect to get the charge of the commutator of two of these zetas. And that's fine as long as diffeomorphism invariance is a symmetry of nature. But there is a potential complication, and that is that you could end up with some other stuff here, k of zeta and zeta prime. And if such a term actually wasn't 0, 
then you would violate diffeomorphism invariance, and that would be something of a disaster because it would mean that uh, result, physical results would depend on the coordinate system that you used. So this thing somehow, if it ever appears, ought to be cancelled by something. We're going to be interested in evaluating this quantity on the event horizon because if you are going to be an observer sitting in the region exterior to the black hole, then you will inevitably say that the surface of the event horizon represents a boundary of space-time. It's a region in which you cannot make any observations uh, inside of. You cannot observe what happens in the black hole, and therefore the event horizon represents a true boundary of the space-time, at least as far as what you're going to observe is, unless, of course, you decide to fall in. So these things, these cues, will exist on a section of the horizon. And the question then is, can you find vector fields such that k is not equal to zero? If you can, then you will discover that unless you do something about it, you will violate diffeomorphism invariance. So we have found pairs of vector fields which, viewed as vector fields in space-time, uh, give rise to two Virasoro algebras which commute with each other. But they give a non-banishing k when taken together, and in terms of the quantum number of these Virasoro operators, which are related to some vector fields, it gives rise to a k which is equal to 2jm cubed. So this is a k which sits on the horizon. That's where it lives, and if you are going to make observations only outside the horizon, then you're going to have to figure out what to do to cancel this kind of anomaly. It's really an anomaly term, and it arises because there is a co-cycle in the diffeomorphism algebra. So you have to think of something which will cancel this k. So let's change tack for a moment and think about some classical calculations in the curved black hole space-time where you're going to look at the absorption probability for particles of energy delta E and angular momentum delta J. So you can look this up in uh, all kinds of places, the general books or really follows on from the work of Tukolsky and Press and their friends. The absorption probability contains some numerical factors outside the front of this, and together with two things that involve gamma functions. So this is the modulus, square modulus of 1 plus i omega l over 2 pi t l, and 1 plus i omega r over 2 pi t r. You can relate these omegas and t's to the energy and the angular momentum of things that you are throwing into the black hole together with the mass and the angular momentum of the black hole itself. So big M is going to be the mass of the black hole, J is it's going to be its angular momentum, and omega L is going to be given by this object, 2m cubed over J times delta E, and omega R is going to be 2m cubed over J times delta E minus delta J. Also sitting in this formula are two quantities, TL and TR, TL is given in terms of the radius of the inner and outer horizons of the Kerr metric by a formula that looks like R plus plus R minus over 2 pi A. Actually, that should be 4 pi A. Something has gone wrong there. And T right should be R plus minus R minus over 4 pi A as well. Um, R plus are just the usual locations of the inner and outer horizons. A is the rotation parameter, and so the angular momentum is J equals MA. So this formula is a formula that you have seen before. If you study conformal field theory, you will, in two dimensions, you will recognize this formula as being the absorption probability for particles of energy omega L and TL, T 
quantity, L being the temperature of the conformal field theory. Um, in this case, it will be a product of two different conformal field theories, one with temperature TL and one with temperature TR. So this is a formula which you've seen somewhere else. And of course, if you see a formula in two different places, it means that you somehow uh, ought to be able to figure out that these things are two aspects of the same phenomenon. So that's is precisely what you say. So you say what this really is, is a conf two conformal field theories. And the hypothesis is that you say that these conformal field theories are what you'd have to have on the horizon if you're going to be outside the black hole so as to cancel the anomaly in the diffeomorphism invariance. So the fact that we found a k which was equal to 2jm cubed implies that one of the characteristics of a conformal field theory are that they're characterized by central charges, Cl and Cr. And to cancel the k, we know that Cl plus Cr has got to be equal to 24j. It is usually assumed to be true that C left is equal to C right, but we have not managed to prove that for our vector fields, or at least not managed to prove it yet. Let's suppose that Cl is equal to Cr is equal to 12j. T left and T right are given by the quantities that we had a little bit earlier. Then we can calculate the statistical entropy of the two conformal field theories which we would say are living on the horizon. And then from a general result of Cardi, you know that the entropy is equal to pi squared over 3 times C left, T left plus C right, T right. These we all know from a knowledge of the Kerr metric. And assuming that CL is equal to CR, you just plug things in and discover that the area over 4 is equal to the statistical entropy of these conformal field theories. So the bottom line is that in order to cancel the anomaly in the diffeomorphisms, you would ascribe to the a section of the horizon the presence of two conformal field theories characterized by C left, T left, and C right, T right. And those would tell you what the entropy is. And that tells you something about the horizons. So these really arise, this, this field theory arises as a way of cancelling the diffeomorphism anomaly. So these are entirely due to the soft hair that you would be able to impose on the horizon. And so we believe that this is how you account for the microscopic entry, entropy of black holes. That, of course, is not the end of the story if you're interested in the information paradox, because the microscopic entropy, whilst it tells you something about the properties of black holes, does not appear to tell you everything about how a black hole could be formed. The most serious problem is the uh, so-called species problem. Suppose, for example, there was simply one kind of elementary particle which you could use to form a black hole. Then you could get some kind of entropy by counting up the number of ways in which you could have formed it. And that's whatever quantity you get. But you could imagine there were a million different kinds of elementary particles, in which case the number of ways in which you could form the black hole would be vastly bigger. But the Hawking entropy would remain the same. And so there is a huge puzzle sitting just there. Even if you account for the microscopic origins of the Hawking entropy, you will not have solved the information paradox. So there is clearly much more to be done, um, and that is probably a good place to stop. Thank you. So uh, usually in the 2D CFD, C left minus C right uh, captures gravitational anomaly. Is there any connection in your context? Uh, well, that's a, so that kind of anomaly would be due to the violation of uh, energy momentum conservation in the conformal field theories. Um, so we don't know that that doesn't happen. Um, 
We would like to believe it doesn't happen, but we have not managed to produce a proof that it doesn't happen. It's the one thing which has been worrying us for some time now, actually. Um, I can't tell you any more. Juan. These vectors that you used are, and the fact that there are uh, two copies of Virasoro, does this depend on four dimensions, or you would have the same in all dimensions? Oh, so the answer to that is that we have only thought about four dimensions. Um, in the case of some higher dimensional black hole, of course, the entropy is still equal to a quarter of the area of the event horizon. But then it's not clear how you would look at these two-dimensional conformal field theories. In actual fact, they really arise because you have two killing vectors in the problem in dimension four, d by dt and d by d phi. If you were looking in dimension five, you'd have three killing vectors, and it could be that pairs of those things tell you about the conformal field theories, but we don't really know. We haven't looked at the matter yet. Um, so uh, I, I would have said that all of these charges, Q, actually don't carry any information because they're generators of gauge transformation, so they're zero acting on physical states. Uh, I think the only, usually we say that the only gauge transformations are physical or the ones which are non-trivial at spatial infinity. So, uh, yeah, why is it, why, how, how can this algebra tell us anything about, you know, counting the actual physical states in the Hilbert space? Well, the charges that you are talking about will, in general, be conserved charges, so that if you think about time evolution... Well, they're very conserved. They're zero. If, if we think about these charges, as you evolve in space-time, they will be defined in an in a example in which you have gravitational collapse. They will be non-zero at scry minus. They will be conserved as you move to a f the future, which is covered by scry plus and h plus, and they don't all necessarily zero on scry plus. Therefore, they must exist on h plus as well. Oh, all right, I don't want to. We have time for one more question. <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the particular form of the, of the anomaly you got uh, is, um, it depends on the particular uh, you know, lo local symmetries you're using. I'm curious, so is it the case that are there other vector fields that will give you different local anomalies? If so, why, why focus on this one? Oh. Is, that, is, that, is there a good physical reason why you expect that, that uh, the, these particular ones are going to be intimately related to entropy? The question that you're asking is, do we know that there are no other vector fields yes. that give rise to an unvanishing K? That's right. Uh, I do not know that. Okay. One more question. <laughs> you, you said at the beginning that you were going to think of the event horizon as a boundary to space-time, because yes. anybody outside can't say anything. So does that mean that these arguments don't apply to more observer-dependent horizons, like in De Sitter space or oh. Rindler and things like that? Well, so the answer to that is that I sort of feel that they should really apply to anybody's uh, horizon in the following sense, that if I follow my null, if I look at uh, my past null cone as I go off to infinity, surely I'm going to have similar, pro similar issues on that. So in De Sitter space, it's clear that that should happen. And I think that Aaron probably convinced us that that was going to happen. And that's intriguing because it means that somehow whatever is going on on the past light cone is going to be observer dependent. And that's perhaps not too surprising because you know that some object, some person falling into the black hole should not see Hawking radiation. But of course, a person falling into the black hole will um, not regard the horizon as a boundary of space time. So let's thank Malcolm again.